Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome to our Sunday morning service. So good to see you guys. How are you guys doing this morning? Man, we're ready to worship our Jesus with you guys. Come on, let's start by doing that. Lifting our voices to our Savior today. We're going to start by singing a new song to him. Here we go. that people the weather is beautiful are you glad to be in church today come on yeah yeah hey before you guys grab a seat would you turn to the person next to you and say good morning maybe give them a high five fist bumps perfectly acceptable if you're a germaphobe that's why we invented them awesome awesome would you guys grab a seat 
Hey, if you don't know us, my name is Lindsay. This is my pal, Andrew. Hello. It's so good to be here this morning. We're gonna have a great service together. If you are new to Church on the Move, we just wanna say welcome. We're so glad to have you. We'd love to get to know you. We'd love to know your name. Would you do this? There is a card in the seat back in front of you. It says next steps on it. Would you grab that at some point during the service? Fill it out. You can drop it in the giving buckets as they go by or in the red drop boxes on your way out of service tonight. We just want to get to know you and know your name. That's right. You picked a great day to be at church. Yes. We are right now in a teaching series called An Open Door. Has this series been awesome or what? Anybody yes. else get some great stuff? Yes. Yes, and if you were here last week, got to do a quick recap. Pastor Witt challenged us to take someone to coffee. We've supplied the coffee, and you guys did it. You killed it. You wiped the gift cards out. It was awesome. As early as Monday morning, as soon as we posted it, you guys were all over it. Hundreds and hundreds of people were going to coffee and being an open door for people. Give yourself a big round of applause. That was awesome. It was so cool to see. Our notifications were going crazy on the Starbucks app. It was really cool to see. And hey, today's message is going to be incredible. Pastor Lee Martin is in the house, everybody. Our discipleship pastor here at Church on the Move. Now, if you don't know much about Lee, he's like Smiley Dynamite, okay? He is pound for pound the most encouraging man on the planet. He's got a great message. We're going to have a great service. And of course, this series is strategically aligned with the calendar to lead us right up to Easter. And we told you a lot about Easter last weekend. You're not going to want to miss Easter at Church on the Move. It's going to be an incredible service. We're going to have a party here at Central Campus. And of course, the biggest Easter egg hunt ever after each service. Yeah, and we didn't land on the biggest right away. We know that's kind of like a bold claim. Yeah, it's like a power move. Yeah. 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 We had a couple of good good names before That's true. we landed we on that one. We didn't just say, oh, let's just call it the biggest. We went through a couple options. Like, I wanted to call it Eggpocalypse. Yeah. You'll egg for mercy. Yeah. You know, maybe have Steven Seagal in a bunny suit, just fastballing eggs at kids. I don't know, just off the top of my head. It was a good idea. Yep. A little violent yeah. and Didn't aggressive. Test well. yep. Yep. Yeah. So I thought maybe we could soften it up a little yeah. bit. Oh. I wanted to call it something like this. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Cage free organic yes. egg hunt. Yep. You'll notice they're free range and egg thickly raised. That's good. That's good. <laughs> But you know, we thought, hey, we need to go trending. We need to go like relevant current issues. Let's go Avengers Egg Game. Yeah. Get it? Is that End Game? See what good did one. there? See Andy. Yeah. Andy. It was good. a good one. The Infinity good Stones one. are eggs. That's my favorite part. You know, it's a little Easter egg for you. Surprisingly, yeah. we ran into some copyright issues. Yeah, didn't see that coming. That was that was yeah. that was surprising. So you we'll know what? Watch. We just decided let's call it what it is: the biggest Easter egg hunt in the history of Church on the Move yep. ever. It's gonna be awesome. You're gonna want to make sure that your kids are here and they stick around after each service. Listen, there's not just candy on the line here, okay? You can help us kind of get some hype going with your kids. Yeah. We're giving away bikes. We're giving away Nerf gun sets. We're giving away video game consoles in an Easter egg hunt. How's that gonna work? We got the details. Don't worry about it. It's gonna be incredible though. They will not want to miss it. Yes, and that Easter egg hunt is happening after every Easter service. If you don't know, we have two Easter services on Saturday night, one at five and one at seven. And then we have two services on Sunday morning, one at nine and 11. It's gonna be so much fun, you guys. We're so excited for it. We've got invitations and you can invite somebody to come with you to Easter. It's gonna be so much fun. Grab an invitation on your way out. Be thinking about who's gonna come with you and enjoy this Easter egg hunt with us. It's gonna be awesome. That's We're right, but lost. listen, who says we have to wait until Easter weekend to start hunting Easter eggs, all right? I yeah. say we start it right now. Here's what you're gonna to wanna to do. If you're not following us on Instagram, go ahead and do it. See you TM Tulsa, because we're gonna start hiding these Church on the Move Easter eggs around Tulsa and some hot spots. We're gonna post some clues on where we're hiding them. Inside those eggs, there's a prize for you and your family. There's a little invite for Easter. So follow us and look for the clues. The Church on the Move Easter egg hunt has begun. Yes, plus we put together a pretty epic video to help explain the Easter egg hunt and spread the word. We're gonna post it on social media a little bit later. You can give it a like, give it a share, but we're gonna play it in service right now. So take a look.
spread a little good and stand to your feet. Let's continue to sing to our Jesus today. When darkness tries to roll over my bones, when sorrow comes to steal the joy I own, when brokenness and pain is all I know, oh, I won't be shaken. No, I won't be shaken. If you know what's singing, my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I. Stand in your love. Amen. Shame no longer has a place to hide. Well, I am not a captive to the lies. And I'm not afraid to leave my past behind. Oh, I won't be shamed. It's your body 
Yeah.
continue singing this song. And we're on a mountaintop, and you're doing amazing things in our lives, and we see it and we feel it, but some of us may feel like we're in a valley. Wherever we find ourselves, let us remind, let us rem remember the words of Psalm 23. Lord, you are a shepherd. We shall not want. You made us lie down in green pastures. You lead us beside still waters. You restore our soul. You lead us in the paths of righteousness for your name's sake. Yea, though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we will fear no evil, for you are with us, God. Your rod and your staff, they comfort us. You go before us and prepare a table in the presence of our enemies. You anoint our head with oil, our cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our life, and we will dwell in the house the Lord forever. Amen, church. Amen. Amen. So God, we give you praise and thanksgiving because we know that you are Lord. And we fight our battles by lifting our hands. We fight our battles by letting go, by giving you lordship over our lives. You are strong when we are weak. And we love you. You're the best kind of Savior. You're the best kind of Lord. You're the best kind of shepherd. You fight on our behalf. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Are you grateful to be in his presence today, church? Amen. Thank you guys so much for singing. Go ahead and take your seat. Praise God. God is so good. It's a great, great day to just worship him with you guys. Man, I love this. We're going to continue to worship our Savior by giving. Uh, this is something that we believe in as a church. Uh, we want to give back to our Savior for everything that he's given to us. So I want to encourage you, if you brought something that you'd like to give, you can go in and get that ready. Uh, we have a few ways you can give. You can go to cotm.info. That's our website. Just follow the giving prompts. Uh, you can also text to give. If you want to text the word give to the number 23101. And if you want to give specifically to our Love Your Neighbor initiatives, you can text the same uh, text to the same number, L-Y-N. It stands for Love Your Neighbor. And you can also use the envelope in the seat back in front of you. But let's do this. Let's, let's, let's pray. And we're going to take just a brief moment to worship together by giving. And then we'll continue on uh, with our service. I'm so excited for you guys to hear Lee's message. Let's pray together. Lord, we love you. I'm grateful for every person that I'm with right now. In this room, online, out in the lobby, every person who has gathered to worship you. I'm grateful to be here with them. Lord, thank you for your presence. Thank you for changing our lives, God. That's why we give. That's why we worship you. We love you. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. What's going on, Church on the Move? How are you doing today? Eh. Eh. I'm going to need more than that. How are you doing today, Church on the Move? All right, there we go. I like it. That's better. If I haven't met you before, my name's Lee. I used to be the discipleship pastor around here. Now I am the pound for pound most encouraging man in the world, evidently. And I'm not sure how you defend that title, to be honest. I'm also not sure how you fit it on an email signature, but I'm going to figure that out. I'm going I'm to discover how that works. Um, every now and then I get a chance to speak 
uh, at, our, at different stages at our different campuses, and I'm so thrilled to be here with you guys today at Central Campus. Before we get started, I just want to say hey to our friends up at 180 and out at the BA campus. Special shout out to our brothers and sisters at Dr. Eddie Warrior and Dick Connor Correctional Center. Guys, can we give it up for those guys? Yeah. We know you guys are out there. We're glad you're a part of our church family. And maybe you're just watching on a screen in a living room or on your cell phone. We're glad you piped in here with us because it's a great weekend. Uh, we're in the middle of a series called An Open Door. And we've been talking about how we take the doors of the church out into the community, into neighborhoods and into workplaces and into classrooms. And physically, that's impossible with the actual doors of this building. But here's the good news. God never intended the church to be a building, right? Right? Like, you know that. The church is us. We are the church. And so when this service is over and you go get in your car and you spread out all throughout the Tulsa area, we're doing exactly what this series is about. We're taking Jesus and our church out into every part of our city. But you know, I was thinking, there's a problem. You see, an open door means nothing if we aren't willing to walk through it. An open door means nothing if we're not willing to walk through it, not for us and not for the people that may be on the other side of that open door. And some of you have been praying like Heather challenged us a few weeks ago. You've been praying for a family member, for a friend, and you've been looking for that opportunity to have a conversation, to go to coffee, to maybe talk about the things that really matter, or maybe, just maybe, help that person take one step closer to meeting the real Jesus. But that makes us nervous. Because we aren't always sure if we're a great representation of our church or of our Lord. And so we're uncertain about what lies beyond an open door. Because sometimes we think, what if that person I take to coffee isn't really receptive to what I want to talk to them about? Or what if I get a label at the office or in the classroom, Jesus freak, religious nut, and I don't want to come off that way. Or the worst one would be, what if we go to that coffee and somebody asks me a question and I don't know how to answer that question? And so I don't represent Jesus well and I don't represent my church well. And we're nervous about stepping through those doors, but I got something to tell you. I got something to share with you this morning. I know what lies on the other side of the doors God opens. Do you know what it is? It is the adventure of your life. And that may sound like an oversell, but it's not. On the other side of the doors God opens is the adventure of your life. And the reason that I know this is because Jesus tells us that in his word. In John, the 10th chapter and the 10th verse, this is my favorite passage of scripture in all of the Bible. And Jesus is teaching in this passage, and he tells the people there, we have an enemy, he's a thief. And he comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. But Jesus says, I have come that you would have life. And man, he could have stopped right there. And we would have just said, yes, Jesus came. And the work that he had to accomplish overcame death. And now when we die, that's not the end. We get to live on forever in heaven with God. But that's not where he stopped in this passage. He said, I have come that you might have life and have it to the full. I call this the capital L life. Some passages or some translations say this is life more abundantly. The, mis the mission, or sorry, the message translation says this is life beyond anything you could have dreamed. Capital L life. And that's for right now, not just somewhere far off in the future. And you know, when someone learns to live this capital L life, there is a certain power that is unleashed all around them. You know some people like this. You're drawn to them. The best of you comes out when you're around them. Some of us long to be those people. There was a pastor and a civil rights leader back in the late 40s and 50s. His name was Howard Thurman. I found this quote from him years ago. I committed it to memory because I like it so much. Here's what Howard Thurman said. He said, don't ask yourself what the world needs. Ask yourself what makes you come alive and then do that because what the world most needs are people who have come fully alive. 
You see, there's a difference between just being upright, having a heartbeat, breathing oxygen, and being fully alive. But we struggle with this, don't we? We struggle to access, access this, and you know why? It's because this kind of life, it got hijacked all the way back in the garden, all the way back at the beginning, and it still gets hijacked today. You see, you want to live this life, but then sin creeps in, and then the distraction of our busy lives and maybe disappointment, maybe suffering, maybe loss. Some of you are dealing with a personal failure right now. Others of you have been abandoned and betrayed by someone who never should have abandoned you. And if all that weren't bad enough, you've got an enemy who's always whispering in your ear, you're not worth anything. If people really knew you, they'd walk away from you. And God, God can't be trusted. God doesn't come through, at least not for you when it matters. You see, there's so much in our world that is at odds with the capital L life. But I want to tell you something today. Listen, listen. Just because this life is under attack doesn't mean it's not fully available to you today. It doesn't mean that you can't, yeah, let's go, that's, that's good news. It doesn't mean that you can't experience the capital L life in your world, in your circumstances, even if they're circumstances that you never would have chosen for yourself. You see, the adventure of your life is probably not going to be easy. It may not be exactly what you'd, you expected, but that's the nature of adventures, isn't it? You don't create or control an adventure. You just go on an adventure and find out what happens, right? You step through a door into the unknown. You know, I think stories often help us make sense of our life, and I love adventure stories. How many of you like the Lord of the Rings trilogy? Yeah, I love, I, love, I love the Lord of the Rings. I love the adventure of it. And there's this conversation that happens right in the middle of that adventure. It's between the two main characters who are hobbits. I, I really like these hobbits. And let me just stop for a second right here and just say, I don't need anybody coming up to me after the service with some hobbit jokes. All right, I've heard all the hobbit jokes, all right? You can just, it's, it's too easy. It's been done. But there's this conversation between Frodo and his friend Sam, and they started off in the Shire where it was just peaceful and serene and joyous, like everything was great in the Shire, but now they've been on an adventure. They've encountered battles. They've encountered loss. They've encountered evil. And Frodo turns to his friend and he says this, I don't like anything here at all. And that actually may be where some of you feel today where you may be. Frodo says, step or stone, breath or bone, earth, air, and water, they all seem cursed. But so our path has been laid. Yes, that's so, said Sam. And we shouldn't be here at all if only we'd known before we started. But I suppose it's often that way. The brave things in the old tales and songs, Mr. Frodo, adventure, as I used to call them. Sam says, but that's the way it is with these adventures, these tales that really mattered, the ones that truly stick in your mind. Folk in those stories just seem to have landed in them, usually. Their paths were laid out that way, as you put it, Mr. Frodo. And then I love this line, but I expect they had lots of chances just like us of turning back, only they didn't. For if they had, we shouldn't know of them because they would have been long forgotten. And then he says this, and I wonder what sort of tale we have fallen into. Now friends, if you are not able to see your life as an epic story that is unfolding, then the thief has done his job. He's robbed you of seeing the truth. 
You see, when Jesus is talking to us in John 10, 10 there, he's not just offering us a gift that when we die, we get to open up and still live on with God in heaven. He's offering us an invitation, an invitation into a story that God has been telling from the beginning of time, a story in which you have a unique and purposeful part to play. And you don't want to miss the adventure of your life with him just because you're not willing to walk through the doors that he opens. I got to take an amazing, epic adventure last August. I got to go with my best friend, Brian Job. We paid a guide service in Seattle, Washington, flew out there, and got to climb one of the most iconic mountains in all of the United States, Mount Rainier. I took a picture from the plane. This was our first view of Mount Rainier. It's just a massive, glaciated mountain. And we had never, we'd climbed a lot of mountains, but we had never done anything like that. We landed in Seattle, and we, we drove out toward the mountain, and we were climbing with this guide service that had kind of a base camp with some lodging and some restaurants and that kind of thing. And we were sitting there having dinner, and we were watching the teams that had just climbed that were coming back to the base camp. And I mean, people were getting off of these buses, and, and there's the, the beard, and they look like warriors coming back from battle, and just rugged mountain men guys. And we were like, yes, these are our people. Like, this is what it's going to be like. We're going to make a bunch of friends, and, and we're going to make a lot of connections, and yes, this is where we belong. This is what we need to be doing. And, and every team would have maybe one or two girls on the team, and those girls would be like triathlete, CrossFit, like stud girls, maybe a lot of armpit hair, you know, this, these kind of girls... You know, and it's just cool. We're like, yes, this is what we're going to experience. And we hadn't met anybody on our team yet. And we saw that there was a bulletin board there in the restaurant. And it had the list of all the, the climbing teams for that week. And we're like, oh, let's go see who's on our team. And we went over there. And sure enough, Brian and I's name were right at the top. Brian Job, Lee Martin. And, and then there was, there was Crystal. And there was Jessica. And there was <laughs> Cece. And there was Lindsay. And there was Jamie. There was Claire, and then there was our lead guide, Gloria. <laughs> and it hit us. We were put on the girls' team. <laughs> eh, it may not be a big surprise to some of you, but it was a big surprise to us. That wasn't what we were expecting. Like, we weren't mad about it. We were just like, okay, that's not exactly the way we thought this was going to play out. No other teams look like this. And if, that was just the beginning, like for the next day and a half, just one thing after another. You see, there were a lot of wildfires going on in California last summer, and all the smoke was blowing north. And we found out right when we got there that there was a chance that the mountain was going to be shut down because visibility was so bad, and the whole climb would be called off. We thought, ah, we've been working on this for a year, even longer. And then we heard that the weather at the summit was terrible. Wind gusts over 100 miles an hour, too dangerous to even go up there. Maybe we could get up to the Muir Base Camp, but, but we weren't going to probably be able to make it to the top, even if the smoke cleared. And we were just like, what is going on? It seemed like everything was against what we had set out to do. And you know, adventures are sometimes like that. They don't go the way you expected them to go. Not what we had envisioned. But God was up to something very special that we didn't have a clue about. Capital L life is sometimes like that. See, I think there are some things that cause us to miss the adventure of our lives. I want to talk about three of those things today. And here's the first one. Don't miss the adventure of your life because you aren't expecting the doors God opens. See, I'd guess right now you are probably praying for someone. Maybe you took Heather at her word and you've been praying for a family member or a friend and you're looking for that opportunity to have a conversation and that's great. Keep looking for it. But today, could I ask you to also pay attention, keep your eyes open for the opportunities that you haven't been praying about, the doors that you haven't been looking for, maybe some that you've been avoiding. That's what Paul's talking about in Ephesians, the fifth chapter. This is what he says to us. He says, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. 
Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Not just your will, not just what you think you should be doing, but what the Lord's will is because he may be up to something that you didn't expect. I think far too often we miss the open doors in our lives because they seem really insignificant and small to us. Now, I want to show you a graphic that I hope will be helpful for you. Check this out. Here's just a simple graphic that I think is kind of everybody's story that comes to faith in Jesus. A lot of us have been at that spot there on the right side where the cross is. That day, and maybe you remember it, when you, when you prayed that prayer, maybe you were baptized, and you're like, this is the day that I surrender my life to Jesus, that I become a new creation, right? It's a great day. But all of us would admit that there were a lot of steps that led up to that day. A lot of conversations, maybe with your mom or dad, maybe with your youth pastor or a group of friends. Maybe you, maybe you read something or you watched a video. Just a lot of steps leading up to that day. And, and maybe some of you there in this room, you're, you're kind of on that spectrum. You haven't quite gotten to that point yet, but, but you're maybe moving in that direction. You know, sometimes it's awesome if you get to be right there when somebody makes that decision. Maybe you had a part of it. Maybe you're over there in the baptism room and you're cheering them on. That's a wonderful place to be, to celebrate with somebody when they enter into life with Jesus. But you know, I think more often than not, we're involved in those steps that lead up to that. They seem small, maybe insignificant, but maybe a conversation that you had with your family at Thanksgiving. Maybe an exchange that you had in line at Target and you didn't realize it. But that interaction helped someone take one small step closer to meeting the real Jesus. You know, over the next several days there on the mountain, we grew to really love and be connected to our team. There was one other guy on the trip. His name was Nat Hawkins. He's from New Hampshire. And Brian and I have kept in touch with Nat. And I told him he needed to watch this message. And so he may be watching now. If you are, Nat, hey, bud, we miss you. Brian and I kind of felt like older brothers to these 20-something and 30-something girls on our team, and we kind of treated them that way. We teased them a little bit. We built relationship with them. We protected them. We served them, even though they were all a lot tougher and in much better shape than we were. And something happened. We made it up to the Muir Base Camp, about halfway up the mountain. A lot of other teams were there, and they had said there might be a chance that we could make an attempt at the summit the next day. And so as the sun was starting to go down, we were all a little nervous about whether it was actually going to happen, and if it did, were we ready? And what had just been general small talk on our team got a little bit deeper. And there was a helicopter pad up there just made out of rock and dirt, a place where they brought helicopters for rescues, and we were all just kind of sitting out there on this helicopter pad watching the sun go down. And one of the young women from my team that I'd built a friendship with, she started telling me, I don't know why about her relationship with her boyfriend back in Denver, how they'd been together for three years and she thought they were gonna get married, but things had turned and she wasn't even sure if they were gonna make it. And she looked at me and she said, man, you've got a great marriage and kids and everything. You've probably never had any relationship problems like this. Open door. And I got to tell her about what my wife Shannon and I had been through almost lost our marriage, and how God had restored us, had renewed us, had saved us. And you know what? She listened. She really listened to everything I had to say. She wasn't a believer, but we got to have that exchange, an open door that I hadn't intended. When I had gone up to the helicopter pad, I had left Brian down at this, this makeshift table where he and another one of the young women on our team were, were looking at gear and trying to figure out what we're going to take and what we're going to leave but by the time I got back down there, the conversation had changed completely. That young woman had told Brian that about a year earlier, she and her husband had lost their baby in a miscarriage. I don't know why, but Brian got to tell her that he and his wife, Jamie, had been through the same thing. How God had helped them move through such a painful and miserable time in their life because of their relationship with him and their church. And she really listened. 
And with tears in her eyes, it meant something meaningful to her. Guys, I wish I could tell you that our whole team surrendered their heart to Jesus on the mountain, but nobody did. But I'm pretty confident that several of them took one step closer to that idea. God had some open doors intended that we didn't. Listen to this. Don't miss the opportunities God has intended even if you didn't. Don't miss them. Don't miss them. After a lot of prayer from Brian and I, as well as a lot of you back here that love us and know us, we got the green light that evening, and they said, we are going to make an attempt at the summit despite all the odds. And they said, you're going to get up at midnight. We're going to go to bed early. You're going to get up at midnight because we've got to start our climb at midnight So we got up, we got geared up, and for the next six hours, we walked in the dark over some of the roughest snow, ice, and rock that I've ever been on. It was scary, it was hard, and it was lonely. You know why it was lonely? We were roped together, but the person in front of you is like 20 feet in front of you, and the person behind you is like 20 feet behind you, and all you can see is this little circle of light from your headlamp. And you just take the step that's in front of you, and you just hope and pray that Gloria, our guide, is leading us in the right direction and then not off the side of the mountain. And you can't go through experience like that and not think about how God, in this adventure of our life, rarely shows us all the way down the road, does he? What he usually does is says, trust me to lead you. And take the steps that you see in front of you. That's always how he works. So over the next five hours, we climbed like that, and we came to the top of a ridge that is aptly named, and this is actually the name of the ridge, Disappointment Cleaver. And it's named that for a reason. Because when we got there, the wind was howling, it was still pitch black, and our guides pulled us all together, and they got right in our faces, and this is what they said, yelling over the the noise of the wind. They said, if you're not sure about this climb, now is the time to turn back. We are about 25% into an 18-hour day that's going to be far more grueling than what you've already experienced. If you can't make that, turn around and go back now. Man, I was exhausted at this point. I was like, I don't, I don't know that I have what it takes to keep going. And if that wasn't bad enough, the last thing they say is this. If you keep going and you have to turn around, if you can't make it, then your whole rope team loses their chance at the summit because no one comes back alone. You'll ruin it for everyone else if you can't make it. Man, that's pressure. And so I look over at Brian, and I don't know what he's thinking, and I don't want to let on what I'm thinking. And so we just did the only thing we could think to do in the moment. We were just like, okay, like, let's keep going and and see what happens. And we could have stopped right there. In fact, about a third of our team turned back right there because of how hard it had been. We could have tapped out, but we didn't. I was afraid, I was uncertain, I wanted to quit, but I'm so glad we kept going. See, here's the second thing I want you to see. Don't miss the adventure of your life because you're too afraid to walk through the doors God opens. Man, this is where we get hung up the most. My fear got tested in a way I never could have imagined. Just after the sun came up, We topped a ridge, and we came to what's called a crevasse. I don't know if anybody knows what a crevasse is, but it's where the glacier has gotten a big crack in it, and this particular crack was about 15 feet wide, and you couldn't see the bottom. It just disappeared into the darkness, into the abyss, and you know what you do when you come to a crevasse like this? They take three aluminum ladders, and they lay them end to end and wrap them with ropes, and then you lay that across the crevasse. If you don't believe me here, I brought a picture. So that's me about to to cross the ladders. Zoom in a little bit on that. Now, we had kind of bad weather, 
that day. So the picture isn't great taken by someone's cell phone. But the day before, weather had been a little bit more clear, and they had taken a picture at the exact same spot, and that's what it looked like crossing this crevasse. Can't see the bottom. Bouncy ladders lashed together, just two ropes that they connect into the snow on either side that you pull up on to try to keep your balance. And I realized I don't know that I've ever done anything more dangerous than what I'm about to do. I was scared. And right there, we could have stopped. We could have turned around, and some people turned around right there as well. But something in us said we couldn't. We couldn't stop here just because we were afraid. Do you know why? Because our longing for what still remained beyond that crevasse was greater than the fear that kept us from stepping across it. Listen, that's what I want for our church. That's what I want for you and for your family. That this longing, this desire that you would have to live the adventure of your life that Jesus offers, the capital L life, that that desire, that longing to be a part of a mission of introducing people to the real Jesus would be so much greater than the fear that keeps you from taking a step through the door that God has opened for you. Gosh, that's what I want for us as a church. So I did the only thing I knew to do. I reached down. I didn't think too much about it. I grabbed those ropes. And of course, those ropes were set up for somebody about six feet tall. So I had the ropes up here like this, trying to walk across the crevasse. And it was scary. And in that moment, I remembered God's words to Joshua in Joshua 1. You know, Joshua was about to cross the Jordan at the time. And he was going to go into the promised land, and Moses wasn't with him any longer, and he needed these words, and I needed these words. And God says in Joshua 1, have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. And guys, I know those words in Joshua 1 were meant for Joshua and not for me, but I just co-opted those words in that moment, and you would have too if you had been standing where I was standing. But you know what I feel super comfortable saying to you? You can co-opt those words right now with whatever you're facing, with whatever you're going through, because the Bible is filled with messages of God saying, don't be afraid, I am with you. And I talked about this just a couple of weeks ago when I was hosting. God has not promised that he will remove us from our circumstances. He's promised that he will be with us no matter our circumstances. And that's good news. And you may be uncertain to take a step through a door that you know God has opened, but listen, listen, listen. If you're taking a step toward God, listen, a step toward God is a step with God. He will be with you. And if that wasn't enough, if just his presence wasn't enough, he's promised to empower you. Listen to what Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy. He says, for God has not given us a spirit of fear or of timidity but a spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline. And then look at this very next line. Most of us are familiar with that passage, but look at the context. So never be ashamed to tell others about our Lord. It's in the context of walking through a door. It's in a context of partnering with God for the kingdom that he says you don't have to be afraid because you've been filled with power and love and self-discipline. Don't be too afraid to step through the door God has for you. Here's the last one. Don't miss the adventure of your life because you're trying to step through the doors God opens alone. The adventure of your life was never meant to be experienced alone. Connecting yourself to a group of people who long for the same adventure that you long for, that gives you the best odds of actually discovering that kind of life. But the risk of going alone is two things. It's going to be more difficult, and it's going to be more dangerous. You see, when I grabbed those ropes and I started to cross that bouncy, rickety ladder, I realized that all it would take is just a stumble of my boot. All it would take was just a gust 
of wind at that moment, and I wouldn't have been able to keep my balance on that ladder. But the single most assuring reality for me in that moment was that I knew I was connected to my team. My best friend was just on the other side, his eye sacks in the snow, his feet dug in, and if I should have any problem at all, he was there to catch me. I wouldn't fall into that abyss. They would help me. They would save me. That's where I got courage. That's where I got confidence. I knew that I wasn't alone. The most wise writer of the Old Testament, King Solomon, said this in Ecclesiastes 4. He said, two people are better off than one where they can help one another succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. You see, even though we crossed that ladder one at a time, every step we took on that journey, we took together. One team with one purpose and one desire, and that's the exact picture of the church. That's the picture of your small group. That's the picture of the go team that you serve on, of the outreach where you participate, of the missions trip that you're planning to go on. That's the picture. Guided and led by Jesus, connected and committed to one another, invited on the adventure of your life. And if you don't have that, it's going to be difficult it's going to be dangerous. Get in a group. Go to next move. Get connected. Take one of those cards in the back of the seat there and fill it out. Here's who I am. I'm new here. I'd like to get connected with somebody. Do it. You don't want to go it alone. I've been alive 42 years, and I can say without a doubt that that day was the was physically the most demanding, difficult day I've ever had. It was the hardest thing that I'd ever done. But despite all the odds, somewhere in the middle of the afternoon, our rope team crested the summit bowl on Mount Rainier, and we stood on top of the mountain. We didn't think it was going to happen, and there we were. Man, it sounds like such a wonderful moment of accomplishment, but can I tell you, it was the most miserable moment of the entire trip. When we got up there, you see, Rainier is an ancient volcano, and there's a big crater up there, and there were 60-plus mile-an-hour winds whipping across that crater, and the temperatures were in the teens, and that wind was picking up these little tiny pieces of ice and pelting us like a sandblaster. It was miserable. Thankfully, it only lasted about 90 seconds because we were doing what they called a touch and go. The weather was so bad, we just had to get everybody up there. Boom, we climbed Rainier, and then we're off the mountain and getting out of there. And during those 90 seconds, I hunkered up against this ice wall that was at the edge of the crater, and I was covering up from being pelted. I was freezing. I could barely feel my toes or my fingers. It was miserable. But I looked over at Brian and I thought in that moment of all that we had been through to get to that place, all the early morning workouts, all the saying no to the chocolate chip cookies, all the money that we had spent, the time off work, everything, all the pain of the climb. And I realized in that moment that there was no other place I would have chosen to be on the planet than right there, right then. You see, in that moment, it didn't matter how hard those steps had been. It didn't matter how cold we had been. It didn't matter how tired we were. It didn't matter how scared we had been. Those were the steps that got us to the place that we never would have discovered had we not been willing to take them. Listen, those were the steps that got us to the place that we never would have discovered if we'd not been willing to take them. Where is God leading you on the adventure of your life? You don't want to miss it because you were unwilling to take those steps. And somebody in this room maybe got approached and somebody said, we need you to... We need you to lead a junior high boys small group. 
And that may be scarier than standing at the edge of that crevasse. Like, I get it. But maybe that's the step you got to take to discover what God really has for you. And some of you have been saying, man, I, we, we should probably go to next move. We should probably kind of get plugged in and figure out what's going on and meet some people. Eh, we've, been, we've been busy. We haven't done it. But can I just tell you, walk through the door. Go out to the red room. Because those may be the steps that allow you to discover what you could never discover without taking them. Someone in your life needs you to invite them to coffee this week. Someone in your life would be honored to be your guest at our Easter services. Someone in your life needs you to slow down this week enough to see them, maybe to listen to them, maybe to sit with them at lunch, encourage them. There are probably a lot of open doors in your life, but they will mean nothing unless you're willing to walk through them. You know, the first part of that verse that's my favorite verse is kind of discouraging. If you remember, Jesus said, there is a thief, and he comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. And you know what? He does. He does do those things. And we know it because all of us have experienced those things in one way or another. But Jesus said, the last word is mine. I have come that you would have life, the capital L life, the life that is meant to be an adventure for you, designed specifically for you. And friends, I just want to tell you this. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for sending your son for sending Jesus to open a door that we never could have opened on our own, a door that leads to life. He's made it possible for us. And we thank you for that, Father. We thank you. And now, God, I ask that you would give all of us in this room the courage to take the steps that we need to take, knowing that you're with us, connected to one another. God, give us the courage to take the steps that lead us to the adventure of our life with you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, it says in Hebrews 12 that Jesus, our guide, the author and perfecter of our faith, for the joy set before him endured the cross. Now think about that as a hard step. To get to the joy that God intended for Jesus, there was a step through the cross. And if he was willing to do that, what are we willing to do? What door are you willing to walk through? Some of you know what it is. Even as I've been talking, you know the person that you need to have a conversation with. You know the change that you need to make in a relationship. You know the, the, the adjustment that you need to make at your job. But I would guess in a room this size, there are also some people who know that the step for you is the step to faith. It's that step at the cross on the graphic where you give your life to Jesus. You surrender it to him. And I want to give you that chance. We're going to pray a prayer together. We call this the believer's prayer. This is the step through the door from death to life, from old creation to new creation. Church, you believe in what we're doing here, so pray it with us, will you? Bow your heads with me and repeat this prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Thank you for sending your son to die for me. I confess I'm a sinner in need of a savior and you loved me enough to come for me. I believe that you were raised from the dead and I confess that Jesus is my Lord. Lord Jesus, I give you my life my past, my present, my future. It's all yours. And today I receive the capital L life. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. And church, let's celebrate those who prayed that prayer. Maybe you prayed that for the first time, maybe for the first time in a long time. 
There's a door right back here. They're just about to open it. And right through those doors, this exit right here, there's another door right around the corner. That's our baptism room. If you prayed that prayer for the first time today, could I challenge you, go walk through that door. Water baptism is your next step. And maybe some of you are saying, I don't really know what that's all about. I don't really know what water baptism means. That's okay. They can answer any questions that you have. You don't have to do it today. Go in there and ask some questions. Find out the significance of baptism. I'd encourage you with that. Maybe you need to take that card that I talked about and say, hey, this is who I am. I'm new and I want to get connected. You can fill that out and drop it in one of the boxes on the way out. Why don't you stand to your feet at this time? I want to remind you before we go that on Good Friday, the Friday before our Easter weekend services, we're having an all-family service right here in this room. Please come. We're going to meditate on the cost and the sacrifice of the cross so that we can truly celebrate the joy of the resurrection. You're going to want to be here. You don't want to miss it. And now as, I, as we go, receive this blessing. May the Lord, here I go again. May the Lord bless and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Have a great rest of the weekend.